Welcome back to the channel, guys. In today's video, I want to do a couple things. The first is I want to talk about some books that I'm presently reading and some books that I've finished. Uh, and then I'm going to get into the nuts and bolts of a portfolio update, uh, the November update in the Manios compounding machine. Um, so just so you guys understand, I didn't start from a financial uh, background. I don't have a CFA. I don't have an MBA. Um, I, at the University of Miami, uh, majored in English literature, uh, minored in classical antiquity and art history, very much interested in the humanities. And one of the things I've carried throughout my life is my love of books, my love of reading. And so one of, one of the things that I, that I did, I would say in my mid thirties, I stopped reading or slowed down my reading in Italophilia in the humanities and started reading in finance, entrepreneurship, economics. So my love of reading was just transferred from one, what one might say more cultural reading uh, to financial reading. And so I just want to showcase a couple books here. So these are a couple that I've actually just finished and then I wanna show you the two that I'm, I'm reading. So these two, um, this is one by Josh Brown, Clash of the Financial Pundits here. Uh, Josh Brown and Jeff Mack, forward by Dylan Radigan, finish that, very interesting. And then his other book here, uh, Joshua M. Brown, um, Backstage Wall Street, these are probably backwards of holding them up like this, but whatever. Um, he actually runs a, a YouTube channel also, I think called The Compound, in addition to appearing on CNBC uh, quite often. And uh, he did an interview, at one of my favorite episodes that he did, he did an interview with the author uh, on the book on Jim Simmons and Renaissance Tech. Um, and uh, I think his last name is Zuckerman. I don't want to say it's Gregory Zuckerman. That's a great interview. Um, we watched it a couple different times. And then the other book that I have recently finished uh, is by one of the Russian oligarchs who's, who's actually passed away, um, How to Earn a Fortune. Boris Borevsky, he died in London. He hung himself. You could put that in quotations. Not, I'm not really sure the, the details there, but he was, uh, in his early career, he was, he was friendly with Putin. Um, they, had, they had a falling out, and so uh, he, was, he left uh, it's for London. He lived in London for a while. And uh, so this, this is interesting. I mean, I've, I've studied a lot of the, the Russian oligarchs. You have uh, Kuzinski, uh, Roman Abramovich, Borevsky. Uh, Alexei Miller, Igor Sechin. Igor Sechin runs Rosneft, which I own. Alexei Miller runs Gazprom, which I own. Um, the Americans were, were kind of introduced to the, Ru the Russian oligarch idea, I think most recently in, in the TV show Billions um, with John Malkovich's character Grigor Andalov. Uh, I believe he was sort of a foil to the Gordon Gecko-esque Bobby Axelrod. Um, but there's an interesting passage here. When I read this, I said, oh, my God, this is me. Um, because I mentioned my, my love of humanities, my love of um, gardening. Actually, I have, um, I'm going to do a video on it uh, fairly soon, I think, where I have my 40 tomato plants, my couple hundred Jimmy Nardello Italian pepper plants. So I spend as much time in, in my garden uh, as I do in my study and, and monitoring my portfolio. So I came across this and I, I jumped here. Um, he, sh he says, what should I spend it on? Do I put it in the bank or buy a present for my wife? To rid yourself of lust, of the sickly fear of unfulfilled desire, I recommend my personal method, a quote, shifting of priorities, end quote. This is when a person, to avoid thinking of money, obsessively gets involved in, let us say, gardening. Very relevant for Russia. The entire day, his head aches over where to get the necessary seeds, what to fertilize his beds with, and how to raise a super pumpkin. And somewhere on the edge of consciousness, on its periphery, dangles a little thought. By the way, those 300,000 next month, they will fall into my lap suddenly. Where should I put them? Can't think of that right now. The seedlings are withering. Um, so it, he's kind of talking about, uh, you know, distracting yourself a little bit, taking a step back from uh, the obsessive uh, monomaniacal focus on money. 
uh, and something something I've done. In fact, I do a lot of my best thinking in in my garden. Actually, this afternoon um, when I done when I'm done this video, I'll be heading to the gym, and then after that, uh, I'll be working my garden. I'll be putting to his point there uh, Epsom salt on my uh, tomatoes and peppers. Very helpful. Um, I'll be putting on uh, some. I think it's like phosphorus, which helps more of the blooms. And I'm constantly watching YouTube videos on gardening. So that was just a little interesting aside. So those are the couple that I've just finished now. The ones that I'm starting now, um, so we have, let's start with this one. Uh, I just received it yesterday. I think it was just available yesterday. And this is the great Ray Dalio, The Changing World Order, Why Nations Succeed and Fail. And uh, I really admire Ray Dalio. Um, you know, because I, I love that he is as much a philosopher, an intellectual, an essayist as a moneymaker. Uh, you know, I mentioned Bobby Axelrod and Gordon Gecko. He doesn't have that sort of businessman obsession like, like a Mr. Wonderful or Donald Trump or Gordon Gecko or Bobby Axelrod, that sort of tough, toughness, uh, you know, just focus, let's make money, let's make money, let's make money. Um, there's very much a... a economics professor, a history professor, uh, a teacher in, in Ray Dalio. And, and he's as successful as everyone I've mentioned, both f fictional characters there and real life characters. It's not a knock on them necessarily. Um, it's just that I, I really, you know, Taleb also has that. Um, you know, he sees himself as much a, a, an essayist, a thinker, a philosopher, uh, as much as a trader, investor. But the thing with Taleb, I don't think Taleb, and I, and I could be mistaken here, um, doesn't run the kind of money that Dalio does uh, and controls and doesn't have the, the net worth that Dalio does, multi-billionaire. Um, so very much, you know, what's interesting here, why nations succeed and fail, um, that would indicate that it's, you know, really in that sort of Graham Allison uh, mold, the idea of the U.S. and China and certain metrics you can measure and, you um, you know, how you can compare civilizations and cultures on their rise, on their fall, how they maintain uh, well status, power, so on and so forth. I haven't started yet. I read his other books um, and, and uh, you know, I, I very much enjoyed watching videos of his and, and his books. So we'll start that after I finish this book. Now, this book is called The 9.9 Percent. The New Aristocracy That Is Entrenching Inequality and Warping Our Culture by Matthew Stewart. There it is. Um, I have read 34 pages of this book. Uh, I read this, I'm reading this book in a way to study the ideas of those who I completely disagree with. And furthermore, who want to in my estimation, crush my empire building. Uh, so in this realm of Matthew Stewart, you have, of course, Thomas Piketty. You have it Gabriel Zuckman, Emmanuel Saez. Uh, and then you have the more well-known figures of, of uh, Joseph Stiglitz, uh, Krugman, Reich. Uh, these are all left-leaning economists. But what's interesting in this book is obviously there's the focus on the, you know, we are the 99% um, as opposed to the 1%. Well, let me say this. I've always wanted to be in the 1%, even when I had nothing, very little hope of obtaining wealth. I've always aspired to be in the 1%. I've never identified with the 99%, even when I was in the 99%. So let me say that. Um, but here he's kind of broadening it out. He's broadening out from the 0.1% of the, you know, the, the, sort of wealth tax, <clears throat> excuse me, and then expanding it from just the 1% to the 9.9%. 9 .9%. And what he's kind of saying there, it's the, it's the sort of, prof it's the professional class. It's the architect, the accountant, the lawyer, the, the guy who makes 150,000 and, you know, drives a Mercedes and sends his kids to private school and uh, spends a couple of weeks in the summer in the Hamptons. So it's not this uber successful multi-billionaire but it's these um moderately successful people 
Um, what's interesting though is you can see how this happens, you know, in, in places like Cuba, uh, Russia, where at first it's only it's only these people. Uh, it's only oh, this a, I'm only talking about the zero point one percent. I'm only talking about the one percent, and then all of a sudden that one percent expands to the it's the, where it's really the five percent <clears throat> or it's really the nine point nine percent and then maybe next year instead of the nine point nine percent maybe maybe mr stewart pens the nineteen point nine percent over the problem and then that nineteen point nine percent goes to the thirty nine percent or the fifty percent meaning as you tax and redistribute and it fails you're kind of looking for new scapegoats and so at first it's 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 Elon Musk and Jeff Bezos and uh, Bill Gates um, and other you know uber wealthy people, and then it becomes no no we've taxed these people we've redistributed and things still aren't any better. So now we need to go after this other class of people. Um, so it's just interesting intellectually, uh, philosophically, just just kind of seeing how the left um, is framing their argument and what their what their ideas and um, strategies will be moving forward so that you as an individual um, can counter these things can take can get ahead of it. Um, you know, what's interesting, being Greek, uh, Oscar Wilde famously said, the new individualism is the new Hellenism. I love that line. Uh, and he he as a collectivist, you know, talks about here on page 23. And this line alone really sums up the difference between myself and the figures I mentioned. We need to accept that health has always been something we pursue collectively as well as individually. So there's this sense of, now you're speaking specifically here with healthcare, but just in general, that sense of collectivism, the idea of we as opposed to I, me, the idea of the common good um, as opposed to individual aspirations, be they intellectual or economic or land holding, uh, so on and so forth. And um, But yeah, so I will read this book. Uh, I'm reading the work of people who I have nothing in common with uh, other than they also uh, are interested in books and ideas and philosophy and so on and so forth. But um, the ideas themselves, you know, I mean, I call Thomas Piketty Marx 2.0 and people quoted that uh, several years ago. I wrote an essay for the Huffington Post on that. But so that's my little preamble on the books I've been reading. And then obviously my take on the 9.9% Ray Dalio, which I'm, I'm going to start after I finish the 9.9. Um, but if you're watching this channel, you obviously want to be part of the 1% because this is not a political channel. Uh, a libertarian political channel necessarily. This is a finance channel where I'm showcasing my portfolio, how I've built it, the decisions I'm making as I try to multiply money and multiply my capital. And so let's get into that. Um, and yeah, I mean, look, if again, if you're here, you, you should want to be part of the 1%. If you don't, I would say change the channel. You know, because that's the purpose of this this channel is showcasing how I've gotten here, how I'm trying to go from running a few million dollars to 20 million, 50 million, 100 million. Will I get there? Uh, I don't know. Will Will Matthew Stewart, Thomas Piketty, Joseph Stiglitz ensure that I don't get there? Um, perhaps. You never know in, in this world. But but that's the that's the end goal. So here we go. So we are going to go to my Seeking Alpha essay. So here are the numbers here, 1.2 million cross that. That's not due to any necessarily, uh, you know, great returns this month. It's just, I put 155,000 uh, into the machine um, from a cash out refi that I learned from Grant Cardone and Robert Kiyosaki on my real estate holdings. And I use that cash out refi to fund my uh, holdings in, in Alpaca Composer. So you can see it brought down the fact that the new cash really brought down my total returns here down to 61%. Uh, was it, oh, I believe at 80, my CHR at 20, uh, just because it's new cash, the 155 is there. So anytime you're going to have a huge cash infusion into an account, it's going to bring down your returns. Um, but so the essay here, 
here it is. Uh, just go through the monthly option strategies and just purchases. I bought Kroger. I bought App Harvest, which I've done a video about, which I love. Uh, a, a company in Kentucky, Martha Stewart's involved with. You can see I bought Albertsons and Kroger. Um, that not only were they showing up in a lot of value screens, uh, it's also kind of a play on food inflation, on inflation in general, but specifically food inflation. Um, but, but, but I also bought Allstate and Tyson. Now, um, what I wanted to show here is how I use different software to make decisions. And I really rely on software. I've obviously done a lot of videos on Composer. That's sort of a, a more quant, what I see is a quant-based type of um, software back testing, then you can um, um, deploy strategies. I'm also gonna showcase fast graphs here, and that's a more fundamental value-based um, software that I use. So Allstate and Tyson were both showing up as well as Unum here on a lot of the value screens. And when I'm looking through my value screens, which are uncorrelated from each other, from different companies, I'm looking at Zacks, I'm looking at Guru Focus, I'm doing some different screens. And these things, when I'm seeing commonality show up, when I'm seeing Allstate showing up on maybe a Peter Lynch screener and a, and a Buffett Munger screener and Allstate's on both, I'm like, hmm, that's interesting. And then I'm, if I'm seeing it on a, on a Zach screen, I'm like, oh, wow, it's now on three, that type of value screens. What I like to do before I make a decision is I pull up fast graphs and... And I actually have Allstate pulled up here. So let's let the screen come across. So you see the black line here is where the stock is as of, this is, looks like November 30th. Uh, well, now it'll get 12.2. Okay, so it's live. $109. The PE is eight. Just that alone. Let me just say that the PE is eight. What's the PE of the market? 20s, high, you know, low 20s, mid 20s, high 20s. Um, the blue line is the normal PE as, as over time, what Allstate generally trades at. Then this orange line is the 15 PE, a fair multiple uh, derived, I believe, from Benjamin Graham. And just generally that if a stock is trading at 15, that's maybe a fair value for most stocks. You can see this is well under Allstate, um, the blue line, which is the normal PE and the orange line. So. And there's a margin of safety. It's not just under, it's not trading. It's not like right here. Like for example, if you look at November 30th of 2018, there wasn't much of a margin of safety. It's PE was 11, um, 11.18 from the blue line here. But look at, look at this margin of safety you're seeing in, in um, all state right now. So that's a, that to me is like, oh, that, that's very interesting. So that's what I purchased this month from the premium for my option strategy. So that's all state. Let's also take Tyson. I want to show the three kind of value stocks that I purchased this month. And again, I like to go through my screens, but then at the very end, after identifying to pull up fast graphs and just pull it up here and see if the value screens or some of my own screens. Here we go. Look at this. I mean, look at the margin of safety between both. You know, the normal PE here is 15.7. Uh, and then also, in addition just to the value screens in this, Tyson is also like an Albertsons or Kroger, is kind of a play on food inflation. Um, you know, they're, I believe they're the biggest producer of chicken. When I had my vineyard in North Carolina, uh, Tyson had a big factory in that area in North Carolina uh, in Wilkes County. And uh, yeah, they're just big producer of chicken. I think believe the biggest, but but look at this margin of safety between the orange and the blue. Now notice the orange is lower here than the blue because that 15 um, is here, but the actual, the normal PE ratio is a little bit above 15, but it's beneath both of them significantly. Again, compare that to here. Let's go up a little bit, like right, if we can get it a little lower. Yeah, like right here. It's trading, you know, at 14, this was in um, January of 2020. It was, it was trading at $82, but its PE was 14.9. So it was trading just sort of at that 15 PE. There isn't much of a margin of safety um, there, but look at all the margin of safety that's developed now. Huge gap between this and this. Okay. And the last one that I picked up this month is Unum. I've also purchased that before. 
uh, Unum Group Insurance Company. So here we go. And let's go, go. All right, so Unum, here we go. And look, look at it again. You know, you're seeing the normal P of Unum is 9.25 the what one might call the uh gram p you know if you get the gdf gram dodd um 15 and, and look at where it's trading it's trading at 2303 a p of five so just think about this here unum is trading at five times earnings so let's say there's a five thousand point pullback in the market okay Let's say that's that happens. So so what happens to Unum? Does it does it trade at two times earnings or three times earnings? Um, does it not move at all because it just it it can't it can't it's not going to trade at one times earnings or two times earnings or if it does that's fine. I mean look at the dividend yield. You have you know five point two one uh, here and it's blended PE of five point two four. Now, for those of you who follow me, you know that I've created these metrics called the Maniosian and Super Maniosian. And that really is the Maniosian is where the ratio between the price to earnings and the dividend yield is under two. And the Super Maniosian is when the dividend yield is actually greater than the price to earnings. So here you can see the dividend yield is showing 5.2, the blended P of 5.24 dividend yield of 5.21. It's almost a one-to-one -one ratio. If this dividend yield were showing at 5.25, just a little bit above here, it would be a super maniosian, but as it stands, it's a maniosian. Um, but, but look at this. I mean, look at look at this margin of safety between it. Again, it doesn't necessarily trade much uh, at, at this kind of valuation, but even, even at this nine, there's a huge margin of safety. And then what's gonna happen the dividend yield is is not cut in a big market itself, which it's unlikely that it would. Then, if it does trade at two or three times earnings, by reinvesting your dividends, you're going to be compounding because you're going to be holding the, buying that at two or three times earnings, say for a year or two, as the, as a bear market ensues. And then, when it comes out of the bear market and it trades even at a modest nine again, um, you're going to do quite well. So that's kind of how I think of things. It's very much in that that Graham, Dodd, Buffett, Munger. Um, kind of value oriented investing. So this is an excellent software that again, I use for my fundamental investing. So let's now go and just kind of see where we are today, see what's going on. Oh, wow, the market was up 2000 before um, I started rolling. You can see anything can happen in financial markets. Not really sure what happened um, when I uh, started this video, we were up, you know, I think a hundred points. So maybe some kind of news came out with Omicron I'll have to see after the video. Um, but yeah, still, you know, 621, um, you know, still hanging tough there. So you can see 621 there. Um, one, oh, look, we were 149 and then it refreshed to 146. So you can see the market is definitely, but let's just take, you know, 621, 146 and all right. 417 in interactive. So about one, one there. And there's another, let's say 40,000 and some smaller accounts. So kind of where we were above that one, two, um, just hanging above that one, two number um, there. So I haven't really done uh, anything much this month other than, and I'm going to show this now in Composer, start to allocate the cash that I have set aside now pack. You can see today, I believe I have six new symphonies going out. I have a symphony that I've titled Fancy Schmancy. Uh, that'll be allocated 2000 at three o'clock today. I have some Bitcoin ETFs in this particular symphony that'll be going out. I have a UDAO market timing BSV symphony and a three fund portfolio and the China, uh, a leveraged China fund. And what else do I have here? And buy the dip fund. So yeah, I have some more about, you know, $12,000 going out today. You can see as the market's open here, you can see that these numbers should be moving, uh, showcasing that, you know, these values are changing, but I just 
I love Composer. You guys know that. I mean, you know, I love this software. Um, very, very happy to use this 150,000 in there. Um, you can see there's 33,000 in cash that I have let, left to um, deploy in Composer. So that'll be about 12 of this 33 going out today at three o'clock. Um, so yeah, that's, that's pretty much it. Um, just wanted to kind of give a portfolio update, showcase what I'm reading. You know, I went on a little personal statement on the 9.9% .9 book on Matthew Stewart. Um, maybe you agree with that. Maybe you don't, and that's fine too. Uh, comments, likes, subscribes, all welcomed. Um, crossed over 2,000 subscribers a couple weeks ago, so very happy about that. Um, but yeah, that's pretty much it for today, guys. We'll be back soon. Take care. Ciao.